it is very important that number one, we include them, creating awareness. Because most of the time, there are a lot of barriers. Barriers that cause persons with disabilities, they love God, they have a hunger and a quest to be able to a hunger and a quest for the spiritual formation like any other person. They have a thirst. Every human being has a thirst and a quest for God, for spiritual formation. But many a times we come to a place where we forget that persons with disabilities and especially the ones who have cognitive impairment and that is maybe neurodevelopmental disorders. Neurodevelopmental disorders are injuries on the brain, on a developing brain or the central nervous system or at times both. And so these are persons who will include persons with autism, cerebral palsy, maybe uh, uh, dyslexia, ADHD and the like. We have such a beautiful sanctuary, but many times we don't have accessibility for these people to be able to be nourished spiritually. And because of that, you find that they are not there, or even if they came, we don't have a platform to minister to them. And so they are left out. They are left behind. Barriers, number one, they could be something like for example, what we have on this pulpit. For example, we have a very beautiful pulpit. And many a times, we are going to be having people come in. But do you know what we have already said in certain ways? That the persons with disabilities, they can be able to come. And even if you are a minister with disability, you can come, but you come as far as here. And this is where you stop. You are not welcome on our pulpit. You are not welcome. You have a disability. And so if you are using a wheelchair, we don't expect you to come uh, up, you know, up here and be able to preach. You can preach. If you have a wheelchair, you can go, uh, you can sit, you can listen, but we don't have an opportunity for you to be able to come up the, uh, the, the the pulpit. Now, this is what we are saying if we have here. But when we have built ramps, the way we have a ramp like this, we have actually again communicated that we had you in mind. We actually know that you have a disability and you have a wheelchair and you are welcome. And so access barriers. At times we could be having even in our offices. There are times that we are in our offices, we are serving in offices, and our offices are up the flight of stairs. We have those people come in, but then they are not able to come to our offices and be able to access, you know, where we are. Or at times, even when we build, as we will, are going to be building at Sitam, uh, Eldoret, and then we put maybe the senior pastor up there. <laughs> yes, it is received, it will happen. And so accessibility barriers, you can just go slightly behind, thank you media team, slightly behind. Um, accessibility barriers, physical environments can make it very difficult. And then, for example, we have seen the child in the classroom. We have seen these children come into Sunday school. We ha are going to be having DVBS coming, DVBS in, the next two weeks we are having DVBS. And we'll be speaking and talking about how we have ministered to a thousand plus children. But then we come to our Sunday school and we realize that maybe we have all those desks there, but we have some child who comes in, they are on a wheelchair, they are not able to be able to write, we expect them to write, but that is how their wheelchair looks like, and they don't have a writing surface. In certain ways, we have told this particular child, you have a disability, we don't expect you to write. We don't expect you to be able to write because you have a disability. At times, it is not just about the wheelchair. Again, it can also be our attitudes our attitudes, social barriers about these people. The attitudes we have and we carry around as a people. 
the attitudes we display. We look at them and we're like, you have a disability, don't talk to me. Keep off. You know, the way we do it non-verbally, the person wants to be able to talk, but then you're like, oh, what are you talking? Oh, you know, you go, let, let me go and call somebody who can be able to speak to you and minister to you because you have a disability. I was at some point um, in an assembly where I will not be able to mention. And this person comes in uh, on a motorized wheelchair, a very decent man, but on a wheelchair. And this decent man goes and wants to speak to somebody and uh, a pastor and says, you know, can I uh, speak to a pastor? And before they even explain themselves, the pastor says, yes, yes, let me call for you, for you somebody else who can be able to talk to you. And so the person comes to me and says, go and talk to him. He has a disability. Go and talk to him. And at the back of my mind, I asked myself, oh, what do you mean I go and talk to him? He has a disability. Why? The association, you have a child with disability. Go and talk to him. He has a disability. And you see, it is all in the attitude. And so the person is there. I listen to them. And actually, the person they were talking to was better placed to respond to the concerns that this person had. And so why are we saying that? That at times, our own attitudes can also be a barrier. And persons with disabilities can be able to see that. The people with disability can be able to know that. Now, disability can be. Um, Defined socially, medically, theologically. Socially, it is where we say that the environment is disabling to a person. The environment is the one that causes the disability in the person. The environment is the one that is inhibiting the person to be able to give to the society the potentials, the gifting, the blessings that they carry also, and be able to flourish like any other person in the society. Medically, disability sees, uh, is defined as the person who has the, dis the disability to be the one with the problem. Socially, it is not the person who has a problem. It is the environment that is disabling. But um, medically, it is the person who has the, pr uh, the disability that is the problem, and therefore they need to be clinically managed. But theologically, again, disability can be defined, for example, looking at the disciples of Jesus Christ in the book of John who looked at the person who was disabled and, looked and asked Jesus, who sinned? Who sinned? And we see those scenarios many times. Even through the uh, televisions, the televangelists that we see, especially here in Kenya and in Africa as a whole, and they are, you know, busy working all around trying to cast out demons. And so when they see a child with autism, a child with cerebral palsy, they see demons all over and they're casting out demons and telling you to do one, two, three things, trying to define it theologically. Who sinned? There must be some demons, powers in operation. And that is why the person has a disability. Now, I don't know which area you lean into. But just to say that as a person, I leave that to you. But let's create environments that are welcoming and helping people to be able to access be nurtured spiritually like any other person. Whichever model you choose to use to define disability, the underlying factor is that the person experiences some degree of limitation that can hinder engagement, activities, and you know, at some level or of a varied extent. And so when we talk about the disability or the disabled, disability is more about physical and mental inability, so to speak factors in a person's environment that through their absence or presence limit functioning and create disability. Barriers to formation spiritually. Now the World Health Organization describes barriers as being more than just physical, you know, barriers. And so talking about physical barriers, 
as we think about you know, a, our environment, let's think about our classrooms. Are they accessible? And when they are accessible, are people able to fit in? Are children, are the youth, and even us adults, are we able to minister and also be ministered to? Let's think about even the toilet facilities at our workplaces, at our homes, and where we are in such a place. Are these people able to access those facilities? What about uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the church, you know, when they are coming? Do we have relevant assistive technology and adaptive and rehabilitative devices to help them? Because at times they are with us and they need us you know, to be able to fit in. But you find, yes, we are Pentecostals and we love you know, to sing and we love to, you know, to, to shout and praise the Lord. And it's very good, by the way, David danced until his clothes fell off. Let's praise the Lord. But then there are people with disabilities who have sensory issues. Now, do they also desire to worship the Lord? Yes, they desire. But are they comfortable, able to sit in when it's very loud noise? Probably not. And if that is the case, could we probably have things like noise cancelling headphones? Do we have the persons with uh, hearing impairment? Yes, probably they do. And if we do not have, why not? Probably because one came to scout around and realized that you know, there, was, there was no sign language interpretation. And so they realized even if they sat with us, they are not being ministered to, and they left. Something like having a sign language interpreter. Do we have persons who have sight impairment? Maybe yes, but maybe no. Why? Is it because they are not there in Eldoret? We don't have persons with sight impairment? Probably because they came and we don't have things like uh, maybe uh, brails and we may be able to project things like this and then at times we tell them, read and follow through the screens and yet they have the sight impairments. So many a times it's because we are realizing they are not able and being ministered to, uh, so to speak. At times, services, systems, policies that are either non-existent or that hinder involvement of all people with you know, health conditions in all areas of life. A number of things, social barriers. Social barriers, let me uh, talk about that. We have, in Sitam, we have avenues where we are not only uh, learning, sitting and learning like this, but we also have social, you know, the, the social aspects. We focus on main, four main areas, instruction, worship, uh, service, and fellowship. And in our fellowship activities, for example, now yesterday, we were having uh, the singles and the, you know, single mothers going. When we went out there, did we factor, as we were planning and organizing, did we think about a senior single or a single mother who could be having a disability and how they can be part of us and let them know, even in our publicity, that they are welcome and let them be there? Are they there? Yes. So social barriers are related to the condition in which people are born at times, grow, live, learn, work, and even age. Social determinants of health that can contribute to decreased functioning among people with disabilities. When we are having sport activities, do we think about them that they can be able to be part of it? Now, all that said and done, so what do persons with disabilities, their caregivers and families do? Many may keep at home and never visit church. Why? Because they will not be accommodated what are the effects to these families? The effect is that such families will tend to resist or reject the church's efforts to minister to their needs because they feel that the church has no space for their loved ones and therefore the family as a whole keeps off. And so when we are here, we come on Sunday and we are looking very uh, beautiful and we don't see any person with disability. It's easy for us to say, oh, they don't exist. At Sitam Eldoret, we don't have persons with disabilities. But my question is, if we don't have persons with dis disabilities at Sitam Eldoret Church, where are they? 
in the whole of Eldoret town, don't we have persons with disabilities? If we have persons who have disabilities in, you know, in Eldoret, and yet we don't get to see them at the Sitam Eldoret Church, where are they? And probably, chances are, if you went to all the other churches within Eldoret, you also won't find them. Does it mean that they don't love God? Does it mean that they are not part of the harvest? Does it mean that they are condemned to go to hell because they have a disability? They have fallen so low of the saving grace of God, and therefore we cannot reach out to them as well and tell them that God loves you, God cares for you, Jesus died on the cross for you. Or are we also sentimentalizing their disability and saying that because they have a disability, there's no need for them to go to church because they have free access to heaven. My Bible does not say that. That because you have a disability, you have free access to heaven. My Bible says no one comes to the Father apart from through Jesus Christ. Disabled, not disabled, you need Jesus to access heaven, and therefore they need Jesus. And so what are we saying? We are then saying that this is a group of people, a number of them unchurched, people who, know, who need Jesus. And so us not seeing them in church presents issues. What issue? Because people in this category in most parts of the world continue to experience disrespect bias and marginalization, even in worship congregations. And as a result, the person feels that they are disempowered, they are vulnerable, they are abused. Why? Because they are the minority. And their voices are often shut by the majority. We are the majority. Even here right now, if I said, those of us who have a disability, let's uh, raise our hands. You'll find if we have, they will be the minority in the group. And so they feel that their voices are shut. Now, if we do not notice the adults with disabilities, support needs in churches, what is the likelihood that we will notice children with support needs? And why am I using the word, by the way, support needs? It's because this, as I began in the beginning, these are persons who happen to have a disability. And all they need is support for them to have accessibility to everything else everybody else in the church is getting. And we have different categories of support needs. Think about a woman who is pregnant, who is expectant. That lady just needs support for them to be able to see through such a service. If the chair is uncomfortable, probably will think of giving them a comfortable chair and give them a, you know, a, a cushion to support their back to make it bearable for them. Support need in our midst. What about the elderly who is struggling with their needs and all that? They just need support needs. If they need, uh, if what about the invalids? At times they need support for our pastors to be able to go to where they are, take the Holy Communion, pray with them, and all that support needs. What makes it different for a person with disability? Nothing. They need support in our midst. And so let's begin to view them as persons with support needs. And support is for anyone. Today I may be here standing, tomorrow I may need support, and I'll still need support to be a part of the worship congregation. And so if we do not notice them, what is the likelihood that we'll see the little ones, the tiny ones, or will we also send them away the way the disciples of Jesus tried? Now in John chapter nine, verse one to four, we see three things that I'm going to uh, mention very fast. Disability needs, responsibility, and opportunity. Now, what about the disability needs? Have you ever noticed persons with disability or support needs in your ministry, different ministries that you work in. Because as we are here and we are serving, some of us are in the worship team, some of us are in the visitation team, some of us are in the media team, some of us are in the family care groups and the like. Ushers, children ministry, youth ministry. 
in those different segments of the ministries, have you ever noticed a person with support needs? If you have, what did you do? This is about all of us. What did you do? If you have noticed such a person, what did you do? Did you become curious about how the people or the person became disabled or acquired the need? Did you begin to ask yourself questions? How did you, how did this happen and the like? And if you ask the why or wondered what happened, beyond the why and wonder, what else did you do? And my challenge is, so are you asking the same questions that other people ask out there and do nothing about? And as Eric said, I think, what odds if you will also just ask the same thing and leave it at that, asking why and leaving at that? The disciples in the book of John chapter 9 demonstrated the nomad bias. The disciples asked, who sinned? Who sinned? They did not see value in the persons who had disabilities. They were asking, who sinned? What happened? How did you become? Why did you become? And with that, they hid or masked their own limitations and vulnerability. They felt that they were okay. Many a times, we get ourselves into that equation where we think we are okay. We think it is okay for me to go to church and sit and worship God. It is okay for that person not to come to church because they have a disability. Their caregivers at times also tend to either hide them or you know, keep them all away and come or at times just keep off altogether. And we feel we are okay. It is in somebody else's house and not in our house. But as a Christian, when you are viewing a person with support needs as a tragedy or unfortunate occurrence, I want to let you know that you will not be able to pay full attention to that person and you will begin asking those questions and you will not include them in your ministry plan. But Jesus aware that this population will be overlooked, made people with disabilities a target group of the Great Commission, and also the banquet. Luke 14, verse 12 to 24. When you have your time, go and read the chapter on Luke chapter 14, verse 12 to 24. And realize that our master, Lord Jesus Christ, knew about persons with disabilities as well, loves them, cares for them, died on the cross for them just as much as he did for everyone else. And therefore, as a Christian, we must sh Christians, we must show comfort and encouragement to all those in need. Second Corinthians, I'll give us a number of scriptures at your own time, just be able to read. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 to 5. Note it down and read on your time. As Christians, you should show empathy and understanding to families affected in order to win them to Christ. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22 to 23. Believers are called to provide practical or hands-on assistance. And Christians can serve as community advocates for the disabled, pleading their cause to others. Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 16. And therefore, all these verses in the scripture highlight the need to remove barriers of attitudes and physical barriers in order to demonstrate Christ's love to the disabled people and inclusive spiritual formation is a systematic change at all levels. Pastors, teachers, ministry workers, the church congregation, policy makers, decision makers, families of persons with disabilities, and the society at large coming together, being aware that we have persons with support needs and all of us are on the alert to be able to make it our responsibility to have them be part of the formation process. And participation means that all people are engaged in spiritual formation activities that are meaningful to them. 
Participation doesn't mean that we just come and we tell, for example, we have told children, all of you go to Sunday school, and they all go. And then we have one maybe with ADHD who is not able to settle down. And, you know, the teacher, you know, just ignores them and continues ministering to this other one who is able to sit down because they have a good attention span. No, that is not participation. They'll still be excluded while included, excluding the included. So they come, but then still, we are still not having them be formed spiritually. Participation means that then we begin to have a mind shift on how to do, we do uh, everything as we target even the ones who have the disability that they are ministered to at their level in such a way that it's meaningful to them as well. So how should we respond as Christians then? Biblical theology tells us we are made in God's image, all of us, God's image, imago Dei, regardless of our physical, mental, or social status. And when we look for biblical mandate for an inclusive ministry, we need to look no further than the Great Commission. There is no footnote in the Great Commission that reads everyone is limited to people with a height over 5.7 inches. Perfect vision. Ability to hear, I like you of a hundred or higher, acceptable public behavior. And therefore, as a person, as an individual, I'm convinced that one's mental, physical, or sensory condition is neither a help nor a hindrance in relationship to God. We are all candidates of having a relationship with God. What is the image of God? Think about the image of God. What is the image of God? Is it a physical appearance? Is it a spiritual appearance? Is it a soul? Now, when we think about that, help me think about that. What's the image of God? Which part of us is the same image as God? Another question, imagine you had a disability. Would you say, I am the image of God? Will you still be an image of God? If you had a disability, will you still say you are the image of God? Yes. And what makes you think that because somebody else has a disability, they stop her being an image of God? If we view a person with a support need as a perfect example of God's image, then our ministry to the person's families and a person as individual and their families will be beautiful and thus reaching to the individual with support needs directly. And therefore, we need to uh, go beyond what we have been doing and reach out. Our responsibility is given in John chapter 9, verse 1 to 5. As we read that scripture, the scripture says, as they passed by, they saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. That is what Jesus said. Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, am I disputing that there are times that, yes, it could be probably as a result of sin? No. However, what I'm saying is, let's view these people. Let's do our part while it is day. Leave what belongs to God to be God's. Let God be the judge, whether somebody sinned or not sinned, to be uh, the way they are. Let God be the judge. Let us not play God to be able to say, you are like this because you did. Who appointed us to be judged over? However, what has God and call, uh, called us to do? God has called us to do the works 
of him who sent him while it is day. And who is that? God the Father. And of course, he's a triune God. Let's do the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. While it is still day, that the works of God might be displayed through every individual, every person, as long as uh, we are alive. Therefore, our responsibility is this, that Jesus calls us to carry out an inclusive ministry, an inclusive ministry of every person. A person with, you know, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their, you know, economic uh, status, regardless of their disability, every person, a woman, a man, let's start reach out to every gender. Who is Jesus referring to when he said we? And what is the task assigned? Who has sent us? When is the assignment due? These are things to think about. When he talks we, are you included? It is not for the pastors alone. It is not for the elders, the advisory board alone, the heads of departments, no. We is for every person. Service for, is for every Christian. You and I, we have been called. We must do the task of the one who sent us. And what is the task assigned? The Great Commission. Go ye into the whole world. Make disciples without discrimination. Just make disciples. Every person is a recipient of God's saving grace and God's saving uh, love. Teach them, baptize them. Include every person. And who has sent us? The one who sent the Lord Jesus Christ. Who has sent us? God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ has sent us. Jesus said, we, you must. You must do it. Jesus has sent us. Let's do it. Jesus sent the disciples. He sent us. God sent him and he has sent us. And when is the assignment due? We go back to that scripture in John. When is the assignment due? When it is still day, my brothers. When it's still day. Now, who knows when the night is coming? Are you and I in possession of time and seasons? Do you know where you'll be tomorrow or today? No. The task is due. And we have just been told, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming where no one can work. Night comes, a night season comes, a night season comes. Therefore, do the work. Why are you a ministry worker? Who sent you to that field? What skills has he given you to bring all to his knowledge? In that department you are working in, in the children's ministry department, in the youth ministry department, in the music ministry, in the media team, in the visitation, in the ushering. Why aren't we seeing the faces of the persons with disability? Does working and serving God only include the perfect, so to speak? Is any one of us perfect? No. Do we think that God has also invested and invested his uh, potentials within persons with disability? Do you think they have something to offer the body of Christ? Do we give them the opportunity to do that? Rarely. Do we really give them the opportunity to do that? Very rarely. We have put them on the receiving end. Isn't it beautiful when we allow them to also be able to serve the Lord? in whichever they, way they are able to serve the Lord. Imagine one day when we see all the people with a hearing impairment up here and they are singing, great is thy faithfulness, O Lord my God, through sign language and worshiping the Lord through sign language as they just give their hearts in worship to the Lord. What about if you went an extra uh, you know, mile, and learned the sign language that when they are actually singing through sign language, you are also singing alongside with them in sign language. Imagine how we subject them to come and we are all using our mouth and they are seated there and they just have to be glued on one person so that they can try and also, 
you know, and so instead of singing, they now sit and look at this person to interpret what you're singing. We can do, uh, we can go an extra mile. Now, why is this task important? Because persons with disabilities have a similar hunger for worship, growth, direction, and support as all other people. They have the same longing for community, relationship, service, and belonging like everyone else. They desire to serve God. And so, as a minister and as a person and as a Christian, you are obligated to help them meet that hunger and longing by loving, welcoming, and serving them as Jesus would. And by doing that, we satisfy their spiritual and physical needs. And by discipling them, we'll be helping them discover and use their spiritual gifts in ministering to others. And the society flourishes, the community flourishes, the worship congregation flourishes when every person is given an opportunity to flourish and be open to the Lord. Our open relationships with persons who have disabilities or support needs in church setting speaks loudly to others, even in the community around. An inclusive church serves as a model to the community. An inclusive ministry helps to remove barriers and lead to change in cultural understanding of disability and other special needs. We are in Africa and we know that disability is still being perceived through the lenses of misperceptions. We look at it as a bad domain. We look at it as a person who is disadvantaged. We look at it as a person who is cursed. We look at it, you know, and many things. We can change the narrative. I don't know, probably the story is different at Sitam, you know, at in Eldoret uh, environment. Uh, but where I come from, I know those are the misperceptions. And that is how it is viewed in the majority of the cultures in Africa. Let's change the narrative. Let's be the story changers. An inclusive church community recognizes that differences in ability are natural and that we are all interdependent. The person with support needs needs you just as much as you need them. We are all interdependent. And therefore, we have possibilities. Possibilities even as we see persons with, uh, with disabilities. What possibilities do you see in people with disabilities at your church? Life after new life. A possibility to lead somebody to Christ and have them serve the Lord as well as you do. The purpose of God in John 9, 3, this purpose was set before the person was born. And what is that purpose? An open invitation for you to sing and experiencing God at personal level. Show you, you know, the, the disability shows you how God uses disability to dramatically remind us that God's ways are not our ways. God's ways are not our ways. God is not what we expect him. Disabled child or disabled person will teach you about peace and joy that flows from open dependence on God. If there is a person that I've seen loves God so genuinely, is a Down syndrome child, a child who has a Down syndrome, a child who has a liberal palsy. By the way, my child is 13 years old. She's not spoken up to now. She's never spoken and called me mother. But that child loves God. Even today, if you went to my house and you asked, where is mom? Her response would be, church. She's going to church. If you give her drinking water, she will tell you, pray. And she will not drink that water until you pray. You give her medicine, she will tell you, pray. Before she takes that medicine. You take her to bed to sleep. She will actually open, you know, tell you open the Bible and read. If you open the Bible and read, she will tell you pray before she sleeps. If you are not there, she will actually take the Bible, go into the blanket, open it, and begin to talk in her own way language, and which I believe God knows, and finish and pray in that language. And I always know God knows beyond what I can hear and understands what she's saying. I can't understand, she underst God understands. This is a person, I don't know how, but she's developed a relationship with God. 
She has a disability. Is it possible that she'll come to a church like this and be dismissed? Yes. She will tell you, I want to go to church. You ask her to do what? She'll tell you to praise. She will actually say to praise. Lift her hand. What else do you want to do? She'll tell you to read my Bible. What else do you want to do? She'll actually tell you to write. You know, and all those things. Who taught her? Not so much me, I can tell you. Not so much me. And so, a special needs person will make you get redeemed eyes to see the possibilities in your regular you know, class and other people. A special needs person will make you discern the humanity and dignity of persons with uh, special needs and uh, uh, vulnerable. A special needs person will make you recognize your own vulnerability. That today, you could be perfect. Tomorrow, you don't know what might happen to you. You might find yourself in that wheelchair. We are, you know, we are limited human beings. We are not in utter control. So begin to look for possibilities by integrating caregivers. Where do you begin? You could ask, how do I begin? Integrate the caregivers and families of persons with uh, support needs uh, people or special needs or persons with disability into your ministry. Integrate their caregivers. Then you will know what God is doing. Because when you integrate them, ask them how they want to be ministered to. They know how they want to be ministered to. Where else will you get that information until you integrate them and they tell you how you can be able to minister to them. So bring them close, integrate them. Allow the disabled child, for example, at times to say a memory verse and it will awaken your spirit. Allow them to sing. A child can have autism but be able to sing. Allow them to sing. Allow them to be welcomers. Some of them have the sweetest smile you'll know. And so it would be very beautiful that we, alongside the welcome team, at least we have a child or a person with disability as they are nurtured and alongside other person that is working with them. So do not leave them out. Do not leave them out. That is the cry. And just to rush through very fast, because of time, I'll give us practical ways to make ministry to persons with disability uh, friendly. Now, instead of letting fear-based questions end the conversation before it even starts, I want to give us just a few questions to ask that will help you, you know, be able to assess your readiness for ministry to persons with disabilities. Number one, ask yourself, do the special needs families and individuals in our church feel welcomed and supported? Ask yourself that question. Now, this is the most important place to start because your church assembly already has people with disability. Trust you me, you may not have seen them. I had been a pastor in Sitam for quite a while and a children's pastor specifically. Uh, I think even when pastor came in, I was a children's pastor. I had never seen children with disabilities prior to having my own daughter. I had never seen as a pastor. We had DVBSs and we are among, among the people who would report, you know, big numbers. 1,500, 3,000 people, you know, children came this DVBS week. I had never seen a child with disability until I had my own and I began to see in the same congregation children with disability. Today, when I sit and I go to a room, it doesn't take me long before I spot a child with disability or I spot a parent who is coming with a child with disability and they are not so sure whether to let, let them go to Sunday school, sit with them or just hang around with them around. I see lots of them. So here at Sita Meldoret, I am convinced we have people with disability, even if we have never seen them. Asking this question in an open and receptive way will allow current members to say what you are doing well, what you are doing right. And additionally, it will free them up to share, you know, some extra effort, you know, that you can be able to put in and make it even better. 
because the special needs families and individuals at your church are your best resource to know what they need and for you to be able to know what to do uh, better. Number two, ask yourself, does our website tell the story of our church welcomes and supports persons with disabilities? We have our website at Sitam Eldoret. We have excelled in other areas. Can our website tell our story on how we are looking out and reaching out to persons with disability? Visitors to your site should be able to type disability or special needs in the search box you know, and be able to get all the detailed information about your program and all uh, you are doing. And this will be helpful uh, uh, to them. And so in this digital space, think about persons with disabilities. Thirdly, ask yourself what are the physical access barriers at our church campus? It is very easy for you when you have actually uh, been at a place to not see the barriers. You, because you become unfamiliar. So you can be able to get a person with disability to help you in that. Another thing that you can do is ask yourself, is there a quiet place where people with a sense of difficulties can participate in worship and just go and uh, not be able to be interfered with, where they can be able to log in and just feel that they are welcome. Should we have a sign language interpreter? That is another question for you to ask. If not, why not go ahead and create one? Could we create a breakout room where children with autism, when they want to uh, steam, because at times they want to steam and they're standing and they're flapping and they're shouting and you want to tell them as a Sunday school teacher, go out, you're making noise, you're bringing disruption. When they're actually telling you, I have a sensory overload, I need to release it out. Can we have a breakout room for them? Could we sometimes offer a sensory friendly service to you know, uh, persons uh, with uh, support needs in that area where we don't have to have acoustic guitars and all that and electric drums and all that and just uh, quieten it all down? Or at times, if we cannot do that uh, in our regular Sunday service, what about having it maybe Sunday afternoon and we are all welcome so that when it is uh, a service for them, we don't leave it, it's a service for them. We, don't, they, don't we expect them to come and sit in with us like this? One Sunday, uh, maybe, uh, uh, once a month, you can allow them to come. All of us, we come and we are the ones going into their world, not them coming into their world, because we have always expected them to come into our world and go about that. Does our church provide respite care? Let me mention that it's very difficult to get uh, care for persons or a child with a disability. Many parents who have children with disabilities or invalids are on the clock 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every week. And many of them have given up things like date nights and all that evenings. And we ask ourselves, why are we ending up in divorces? Families are breaking apart and all that. Some of them for persons with disabilities, it has been because of too much responsibility that they have limited time to even think about themselves. Now, respite care is something that we can be able to do, where maybe different ministries once a month, we just decide a Saturday um, morning, we will come. And we have, let's say, the WM. We give ourselves and we say, that morning we are going to go to church, we are going to care for all the children with support needs and give a break to their caregivers and allow the caregivers to go and rest, go maybe to the salon, go at least have a manicure, a pedicure, or what about even if we went an extra uh, mile and decided, in fact, we'll sponsor you for the same. Go and just go for your pedicure, manicure, a hairdo, and then go have lunch and come pick your child. And as we are with the child, we'll be taking care of the child and the child will be happy. The child will be swinging, you know, and as the child is swinging and, you know, re being refreshed and having social activities around, or at times the children will also take them for a tour somewhere to, you know, to the, an orphanage or to a mall. Most of those children have not even been malls to just see how a mall looks like. We'll take them out as well and just have some good time with them. 
it is good and refreshing social activities. Now, do we equip our bodies with tools for teaching and, you know, and not just childcare? Leverage on body bags for discipleship. How does that look like? This is where a child with special needs come, for example, a child with autism or cerebral palsy and all that, you identify, and here, Pastor, we have to be very careful, we identify a person that will be able to attach to this particular child as a support need, you know, caregiver, a body for this child. Now, these children, to say, they love routines. So you don't give them a body today, tomorrow you give them a different one tomorrow. No, you identify ahead of time, and you get to know for this this particular child, this will be the body, and the body will be the person to work with the child, and that therefore, it means that you have to do good vetting in this day and age, proper vetting, not a person who will end up abusing this child, and once you have vetted, you attach this child, when the child goes to Sunday school, they go with the body. When the child's attention span is over, you know, after three, four minutes, they walk out of the Sunday school with the body, and it's okay, they go to the swings, but now the body has the necessary essential tools for this child to take care of this child. For example, if the child uh, always has uh, saliva rolling out and so the child needs to have a handkerchief or something to wipe all always in their body bag. But then in there, we also have a discipleship mat you know, material. And just something, a picture with a verse that this person can keep on speaking and talking to the child. As they are swinging the child, they swing the child, and they tell them Jesus loves you. And that child will go home knowing that particular day it has been imprinted into his mind, Jesus loves me. And because my body also imprinted and did the same, talking over and over and showed even in actions and you go along body system. You can do that. It's not very hard to do that. And then lastly, ask yourself, are we asking how or are we asking can our questions? What does this really mean? When you ask how questions, you invite problem solving. How can we find bodies? Then you think about it, how do we uh, get them? How can we do respite? Then you think out of the box and you do it. How can we equip, you know, breakout rooms and the like? But a how question will, I mean, I mean a why question will be like, a can question, sorry, will be like, it's no. Can we find bodies? No. Can we do respite? No. Can we do breakout rooms? No. And that um, just shatters it all together. So my friends, Sitam Eldore team, what are we saying? Let us complete the harvest. Let us bring them all in. And I leave us in conclusion, as I call our senior pastor, with these four maze. May God open to us the opportunities opportunities to reach out to persons with disabilities. May God bring to your ministry people with disability and support needs to test your ability to share his love with all, not some. May you not deny your responsibility as a Christian and as a follower of Christ nor turn a blind eye to the responsibility of going to the whole, whole world and responding to the Great Commission by inviting all. And lastly, may God turn those responsibilities into opportunities to minister to the people with disabilities and their families. You can do it. It is doable. It is for us, you and I, to change our mindset and go an extra mile and realize that the harvest is plenty, the laborers are few, the persons with disabilities are among the least reached out to persons and the least given opportunities to also serve the body of Christ. God bless you.